Without exception this week, um, when I encountered somebody who had read this preaching text from Matthew, they said to me, boy, do I have problems with that text. So um, here we go. A wedding back then generally went like this. Um, when it was time for the wedding, the groom went to the bride's house to pick up the bride. And they, the, bride, the groom would spend time at the bride's house. There would be parting. There would, might be haggling over, over dowry and so on. And the wedding party would line the route between the bride's house and the groom's house. And sometimes the, the, the bride and the groom were delayed because of, of the, the, the festivities at her house and so on. So it, it makes sense that that they got tired of waiting and some fell asleep. After, uh, at, at when they, then the groom would take the bride back to his house for, um, for the party and the actual ceremony. Okay, so we're in that time lag um, between uh, picking up the bride and the ceremony at the groom's house. I don't know, I mean, I do a fair share of weddings, so I am used to members of the wedding party being late. I am used to members of the wedding party being late for the rehearsal. Usually when I meet with a couple, I will, they will say, when should we schedule the rehearsal? And I say, I don't care when you schedule it, just schedule it at a time when you're sure everybody will be there. We don't want to be waiting. And invariably, we end up waiting for somebody and we, we then proceed, you know. And there's, say, on the usher side at the rehearsal, there will be a gap where the usher will surely show up for the wedding, but he's not here tonight. You know, and I've done weddings where the bride and groom are late. I, I did one years ago um, where the bride and groom were two and a half hours late, and we just waited, and we waited, and that poor organist played everything she had up at her, up at her console, but it wasn't enough. And I just never forget, I can't forget, the couple finally showing up, and, and I kind of looked at him and like, and the groom said to me, Nigerian time. You know, okay, I, I get it. I, yeah. um, we've all had experiences where we have to wait for somebody, don't we? And we get really frustrated. Uh, if you're on a tour, uh, you know, you're, you're on a bus tour, say, of, of in Germany or something, and you think, God, this person is always late. The bus is always waiting for this person. They were told to be here at 9 o'clock. They were told repeatedly to be at 9 o'clock. It, it's, it's printed here, and it's now 9.15, and we're waiting. We're all being held up. Why does this person think their time is more important than ours? You know, and you think, oh, I wish the tour guide would just leave. And we'd all leave, and they'd learn their lesson. Have you ever waited for your partner to get ready for something, although you reminded and reminded and reminded him or her? Uh, I think I'm just going to go on without him or her. And um, they'll learn. They'll finally learn their lesson. Okay. That's the equivalent of shutting the door, isn't it? You know, that's our first problem with this parable. The door is shut. But there are times we want to shut the door because we just get tired of the person waiting and dragging it out. You know, the train has left the station. The plane has left the, the gate. You know, sorry. Sorry. You know, the door is shut. That's the first problem. But we... You know, you just can't say it's Matthew's problem because we also want that door shut. And sometimes when it's shut on us, we do learn our lesson. I'll never be late again. Yeah. Second problem, and now I'm going to come back to the shut door, so if you have further problems with the shut door, just wait. The second problem in this parable that people have is you have the... Um, the five wise bridesmaids have enough oil. They have enough oil for themselves. 
the five foolish bridesmaids don't have oil. And the five foolish ones ask the five wise ones for some of their oil. And the five, bride, the five uh, wise ones say, we can't give you any. That seems hard-hearted, doesn't it? We can't give you any. Yeah. Especially when Jesus has said, you know, give to those who beg from you. He says, if somebody asks for your coat, give them your cloak as well. You know? <laughs> he says, give to those who ask. And so here are the five wise bridesmaids saying, no, we can't give to you. What gives? <laughs> there are some things we can give another person and other things we can't give another person. You can give me money. You can give me food. You can give me advice. But can you give me your health. Yeah. You can tell me how to be healthy and so on, but say that, you know, I'm in bad health and you're very healthy. Can you give me your health? You can't. There are some things we can give another person and other things we can't. You can pray for me, but you can't do my praying for me. That's up to me. You can forgive me, but you can't do my forgiving for me. Only I can do that. You can love me, and you can love my family but you can't do my loving for me. Only I can do that. I tutor several children at, um, at Hubbard School in reading. And one of the little girls I tutor is, is, is not a very good reader. And she needs to learn to read for herself. And the game she thinks she plays with me, when, I, when we sit down at the table to read, is she says to me, now, you read, and then I'll stop you, and I'll do a word. Now, this is covering up for her poor reading. <laughs> and I'll read along... And she'll see eventually and or the. And she'll stop and say, I'll read. I can't do her reading for her her whole life. She's going to have to learn to read for herself. Some of you have had this experience from Colleen and me where you... Um, contact us and say, I need the email and phone number for so-and-so. And we send back to you and say, it's on Realm, look it up. <laughs> yeah. Some things we need to do for ourselves. And it sounds hard-hearted. I think that's why the bridesmaids couldn't give their oil. Because the oil is really about the quality of our lives. Our lives are filled with love. Our lamps are filled with love and mercy and forgiveness. And I can't do that for another person. They have to do that for themselves. They have to fill their own lamp. Jesus says, 
You know, you are a light. You are a light. Chris can't be the light for me. I have to be my own light to be what Jesus wants me to be. That's the, sec- that's the second hard saying. Last uh, Sunday, we celebrated a, a Georgia Slums memorial service. Sanctuary was full upstairs. Georgia died at a, the relatively young age of 51. She had just celebrated her 51st birthday. Toward the end of the service, we had a time for people to give witnesses to Georgia's life. Um, two of the witnesses said to the congregation, you know, you shouldn't put off for tomorrow what you should do today. If you need to forgive someone, forgive them today. It can't wait. If you need to tell somebody you love them, tell them today. Tomorrow might be too late. Now, these witnesses were not trying to scare us into heaven. And they weren't talking fire and brimstone. They were giving us what they thought was wise advice. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. Life is short. And sometimes the door is shut when we don't expect it. So do it now. If I'm going to tell Susan I love her, I do it today. Tomorrow might be too late. And again, that's not hellfire and brimstone. That's just a fact of life. And you can't do that for me. I have to tell Susan I love her today. This parable is about waiting for Jesus. How do we wait for the groom? How do we wait for the groom? We fill our lives with the oil of the Spirit with the love and the forgiveness and the mercy and the compassion. And I want to say perspective. We fill our life with perspective because there are people we want to shut the door on and if we just knew why they were doing what they were doing, we might not shut the door. It's interesting in the parable. It doesn't say the door is locked. It says it is shut. A shut door can be opened, can't it? A locked door can't. The door is shut. It can be opened. There is a second chance, and there's a redemption in this story. Now, what do we do with this third hard part of this parable where the groom says, I don't know you? I think we look for something of ourselves in other people, whether it's maleness, whether it's gender or race 
or background or intelligence or wealth or dress orientation. We look for ourselves in the other person. That's, that's how we connect. Is it possible when Jesus says, the groom says, I don't know you, the groom doesn't see himself in the other people? Is it possible that Jesus is looking for himself in us? Jesus isn't looking for hate and greed and jealousy and revenge. What Jesus is looking for in us is himself. He's looking for the love and the forgiveness and the mercy. Ah, I know you. I see myself in you. Is that what he's looking for? I think so. This parable is about how we wait for Jesus, how we fill our lives, how we fill our time. In a way, this parable, I'm sorry Barb had to work all these hours learning the parable because it can really be short. Uh, <laughs> you can eliminate the whole parable and just do the first verse and the last verse. You can, all you have to say is, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Stay awake, for you don't know the hour or the time. That's the whole parable. <laughs> Stay awake, you don't know the hour or the time. You can do that now. Barb worked hours on it. You can do it now. Stay awake, you don't know the time. Um, it really is about staying awake. Be awake. Fill your time with love and mercy and forgiveness. Fill your time. It's not about the future, really. It's about now. It's about living in the moment now. Don't wait for the future. Don't wait for tomorrow. Do it now. Love that person now. Forgive that person now. And you know, people who are waiting for Jesus to come might experience Jesus through us now, because we filled our lamps with the oil of the Spirit, and our light has shone. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>